Predator Prey Cycles 101. This graph shows the population of hares and their predator, the lynx, over time. These populations are healthy and their ecosystem is stable. But if these predator prey populations are stable, why are they fluctuating so wildly? If you look more closely at this graph, you can see that these extreme population dynamics are not wild. In fact, what you are looking at is a repeating cycle, a predator-prey cycle. Today, we learn what an ecosystem is, how food chains work, and why these extreme changes in predator-prey populations are normal and even healthy. My name is Chris, and welcome to Animal Science TV. First, what is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is a community of living organisms that interact with each other in a specific geological environment. A fundamental idea in ecology is that all life in an ecosystem somehow interacts with or depends on each other. Let's take a look at the dry savanna grassland biome. How do the lions ultimately get their calories from the sun? We need a basic understanding of trophic levels. All life requires energy of some sort. Trophic levels explain how energy moves up the food chain in an ecosystem. The first level uses photosynthesis to capture energy from the sun and convert it to organic biomass. In the savanna ecosystem, grass is our primary producer. The second trophic level consists of herbivores that eat the grass. Let's use zebras. The third trophic level could be some type of carnivore. Let's use the lion an apex predator which eats the zebra. Can you think of an aquatic food chain? It could start with algae or phytoplankton as trophic level one. Population dynamics. How do populations change over time? For a predator prey cycle example, let's use zebras as prey and lions as predators. To start, imagine in the savanna, there is a high population of zebras and very few lions. How will the populations change? The few lions easily find zebras to eat, and after several years, the lion population starts increasing. Eventually, the cubs grow old enough to hunt, and there is now a large population of hungry lions. They begin to kill zebras at a higher rate, so the zebra population starts to decline. The large amount of lions then quickly drive the zebra population down to extremely low levels, but some zebras are able to survive simply because the lions couldn't find them. Now, the lion population is in trouble. They're starving to death. With few lions left, zebras rebound strongly, and we are back to the start of our cycle with a small lion population and a large zebra population. The lions didn't all die because they can eat things other than zebras, but they only thrive when the zebra is present in high numbers. Clearly, the predator and prey populations are dependent on each other. The reason these cycles are offset is because it takes some generations for predator-prey cycles to respond to each other. Zebras take about two years to reproduce and lions four years. Because of this delay, the predator and prey populations never reach a stable equilibrium. Life goes on forever in these cycles, each population drastically overreacting. Let's take a look at some real field data. 
These are real life observations made for the snowshoe hare and lynx populations in Canada. This is a 90 year graph of pelts collected in the fur trading industry from 1845 to 1935. The Hudson's Bay Company observed data consistent with what we would expect to see in predator prey cycles. This graph isn't an exact match to the mathematical model because there are small variables left unaccounted for, like weather, disease, migration, and the luck of the hunt. Anyway, what we do see here is dramatic swings in both populations. These drastic population drops cause concern that extinction could be imminent. Today, we know these fluctuations in predator-prey populations are normal, but 100 years ago, ecology was not well understood. The study of ecology is relatively new, and it wasn't even a major field of scientific study until the 1900s. One of the first interesting questions that got humans to think about ecosystems was raised by an Italian biologist. Umberto d'Ancona kept a log of the fish catches from three Italian ports on the Adriatic Sea. He noticed that during World War I, the ratio of sharks in fish catches increased dramatically. It wasn't safe during wartime, and many fishing boats were refitted to join the Navy. Could this increase in shark population simply be due to the sudden reduction in the number of human fishing vessels? No, fishing does affect shark populations, but sharks are also in a predator-prey cycle with smaller fish, and these prey fish become the predators of even smaller fish who eat photosynthetic primary producers. The shark is in a complex trophic system involving organisms from algae all the way up to humans. Umberto d'Ancona realized that food chains are all interconnected, and we had no scientific understanding of exactly how. This was a complex problem. He needed somebody to create a mathematical equation that could describe how the predator and the prey each affect each other's population size. Luckily for Umberto d'Ancona, the biologist, his father-in-law was the famous physicist and mathematician Vito Volterra. In a matter of months, Volterra wrote a set of differential equations that describe what should happen when predator and prey interact. Coincidentally and unknown to Vito Volterra, an American chemist named Alfred Latka also was developing these same equations at the same time, only Latka was using them for chemical interactions. The latka volterra equations have predictive power, and they can be used for modeling population dynamics. They take into account several different variables, including the population of both species, reproductive rates, mortality rates, and predator-prey encounter rate. These equations can display predator-prey cycles in graphs like these, between two trophic levels in a food chain, but these equations are too simplistic and require making unrealistic assumptions. We need to understand how multiple food chains all interact together, and the work it isn't done yet today. There are many more food chains than just grass to zebras to lions in the entire savanna ecosystem. How about bush leaves to impalas to cheetahs? Or one with four trophic levels? Oats to ant to aardvark to hyena? With four trophic levels in a single food chain, you could use three separate predator-prey cycles to explain population dynamics between each trophic level individually. For example, you could have one predator-prey cycle between oats and ants, 
a second between ants and aardvarks, and finally a third for aardvarks and hyenas. But there are hundreds of life forms in the savanna that all compete, help, or somehow interact with each other in one giant food web. The Latka Volterra equations break down and don't work in complex food webs. The complexity of the food web does, however, help preserve species like our zebra. Whenever the zebra population is dangerously low, lions will learn to hunt something else that they bump into more frequently. And vice versa, if the zebra population is too high, maybe hyenas will start to eat them too. Ecological science is key to conservation efforts. All life needs energy, and predator-prey interactions are the primary mover of energy through the food chains. Scientists need to stop humanity from destroying entire ecosystems because, ultimately, we are at the top of the global food chain. Understanding how predator-prey cycles work is the first step to understanding how these food webs and entire ecosystems work. We need more people studying ecology to prevent mass extinctions and to make sure humanity moves forward in a sustainable way. Watch more 101 science education videos in my playlist up here. I also have a animal facts series where we learn about cool animals like the seahorse. Thank you for watching Animal Science TV.